everybody welcome back um, my name is Miguel Ortega and I'm Tranma hello how's everybody doing so uh, this is the voice in the hollow we're going over the process the long process that we're currently in to make uh, an animated short film a very violent horror short film entirely in Unreal uh, so this is our fourth episode so if you're seeing this for the first time I recommend you go well you definitely watch this because it's not in any particular order. But uh, if you go back, we go through every step of the process from the story concept uh, to where we are today, which is more, uh, this was like our research and development week, trying to figure out how to do a bunch of stuff that, um, that we had no idea how to do. So today we're gonna be talking about how we're dealing with motion capture uh, so we are getting a motion capture suit in order to do this uh, film. We're going to probably get an XM suit. And that's our next stage. We have our most of our uh, lead characters done. We have a lot of our main sets done. But now we need to think about the performance. Um, so today we'll start talking about some of the facial uh, lens shapes that we're doing. Uh, we'll get more into that next week or the week after that. And just like I said, mocap and uh, some other secondary characters that are pretty cool. So, um, so yeah. So uh, let's get started. So if you just started with Unreal Four, so this might be perfect for you because we just started with Unreal Five. So, <laughs> so we started about we we did do the Unreal Fellowship, uh, I believe last year, and then. Uh, we, we kind of left Unreal because we got busy with other stuff and now we're jumping back into it. So we're no means experts, but we definitely um, managed to make things look cool somehow miraculously at the end. So uh, usually whenever we get something to look good at that night, you know, Tran and I would be like, how the hell did we figure this out? Because we have no idea what the hell we're doing half the time. So, uh, okay, so mocap. So here we have one of our characters. Uh, her name is Ala, and uh, I brought her into Unreal. And right now, I just threw like a, a mocap that we got from the marketplace, so some movement. And this is from a motion pack called, uh, I think it's uh, Conversations. So it's just characters talking. And it's a pretty cool motion capture pack. 
you can get it on the marketplace, like I said, for not much money. And it's just conversation. So there's obviously nothing happening on the face. It's just on the body. Um, but what I want to talk about is if you get something in marketplace, well, this character is not a marketplace asset. So how do you, you can't just transfer motion capture from any skeleton onto any other skeleton without running through a few steps. Uh, and these are some of the things that we had to figure out first in Unreal. And then we realized that we're going to need a little bit more control and we ended up doing it in Maya. So we'll go over motion capture in Unreal and then motion capture in, um, in Maya, like I said. And I'll explain to you why we decided to do this in Maya in a second. But one of the big reasons has to do with the clothing, which you can see there's some, there's some funky stuff going on here, but you can see that some of it is simming. And I'll talk about how we did that and why we don't like the results and why we want to end up doing the sims. Uh, on an outside program. So anyway, so right now, if I come over here, I have this folder. I'm just going to create a new folder here and re-import my rig. So um, let me just call this delete to, and I'll just get rid of her for now. And I'm going to import and let me just find my file here. This should be fine here. Okay. So I'll have my rotation set to negative 90 degrees. That's perfect. Um, and I'm just gonna import. Okay. And you can see under skeleton, there's nothing set. So I'll bring this guy in. Or this girl and just give it a second okay and you could see that here we have uh, our rig our skeleton our physical asset, which we'll talk about in a minute, but this is uh, what's used to calculate the simulation. So these capsules are basically what is actually colliding with cloth or other objects. And that's how it's able to calculate uh, the collision so quickly is because it's actually not processing it on the character, but on these simplified shapes. Uh, and then we have our rig here. Uh, which we'll talk about in a second. But right now, what I want to get into is the skeleton. So I'll double click on this model here, and you could see that here in this folder, I have all these mocap files. And if I double click on one of them, you could see this is one of the mocap files that came from Marketplace. And again, this process applies to uh, bringing in skeletons from Marketplace, bringing in models from Mixamo, from whatever. So this applies to whatever, okay? So the problem is I can't connect that model, or sorry, that animation to the skeleton because the joints are not connected in any way. There's no relationship between the two of them. So what I have to do, and this was our week of uh, r and is figuring out how to remap all of this stuff over to, um, to, to that skeleton. So this is the first thing we're going to do. So first thing I'm going to do is under skeleton tree, let me just uh, bring this down for a second. And let me pull up a few of my notes here just to make sure that I don't forget anything because this is like a bazillion... Uh, steps so let me just set this real quick okay so what i'm going to do is i'll come over here and i'm going to go to my uh show retargeting options and you could see that i have this setting here okay and i'm just going to basically select this here and I'm going to grab this to set this to uh, recursively set translation retargeting to skeleton. So I'll set that. Okay. 
And what I'm going to do is I'll come over here and under pelvis, set this to animation scaled. Okay. So what this is going to do is if you bring in a skeleton that is a completely different proportion, this is going to make sure that let's say you bring in a mocap of a football player proportions, and then you're applying this on a little goblin. This is going to make sure that all of that stuff gets uh, tracked on correctly and the proportions um, rescale themselves to this new skeleton, okay? Uh, so now what we have to do is we're going to go over here to our, our retargeting window, so which is our retargeting manager, and I'm going to go to add new. And when we go to add new, you can see that I have this ala rig, which is the name of this right here. Okay, that's perfect. I'll select that, and under my select rig, I'm going to go to uh, add new. So this one here. And then select rig. I'm going to go to select humanoid rig. Sorry about that. Okay. So select humanoid rig is going to make sure that all the joints are named a certain way. So it's like, oh, you're doing a human? Okay, cool. Well, this is what we want our joints to be named. Is that what you named your joints? And if not, you need to set the, you need to basically link. So you can see here spine one, you have to connect it with spine one. Spine two, you have to connect it with spine two. Spine three, you connect it with spine three. So it's pretty simple. And you can see for the most part, the naming on all of these is pretty good. Lower arm left, lower arm left. But then you can see here hand L and you can see it says none. So this is most likely the rigger uh, named it weird. So we just have to find our hand L. And you can see that for some reason, probably some name spacing issue, it says hand L1. So we just set that to hand L and now that's fine. Clavicle right, clavicle right. So that's R, upper arm, lower arm, hand R, same thing. So we'll just come over here to our hands are, there it is, hand R2 for some reason. It's not liking the, the hands. So neck, head, thigh, calf, foot, thigh, right. All of these look fine, okay? So you could think like, okay, we're completely good here, but you have to also click on this show advanced. And show advanced shows you a bunch of joints that you may or may not have. So you can see index finger one, index two, index three, and then left, left, left. So all of these seem pretty good, except when we get to like the twist. I don't have a twist, so I'm gonna just set those to none. Okay, let's scroll down. Lower arm twist, I don't have a lower arm twist or an upper arm twist. I don't have a calf twist. I don't have a thigh twist. So I'm gonna set these guys at the end to none. That way it doesn't get mapped onto something accidentally. Okay, so ball right, I don't have that. And this is much harder to do when you have a camera pointed in your <laughs> face, just so you know. Uh, so let's see, uh, so none, none. So all of these look pretty good. Okay, so that looks cool. So if I come over here again and I click on the conversation uh, folder, it has the mocap. You can see that this guy, uh, his proportions are different. And one of the things is the way he's rigged is slightly different. His arms are a little bit more opened up. Um, you can see it over here actually. So his arms are a little bit more open than our character in a neutral pose. So what I'm gonna do is I'll select her arm here and I'm gonna just bring it up just a little bit. So I did three snaps. So that it's a little bit closer. And then I'll go to my modify pose and I'll go to use current pose. So now you can see it's gonna say, hey, I want you to retarget everything. 
I told you how I want you to rescale everything here. I told you what I want you to rescale each thing to. And this is the pose that I want you to use as neutral. Okay. Uh, so now I could save this. Okay. And let's close this. And one thing I'll do if I come back over here to my folder here, I'm just going to call this something that's a little bit easier to remember. So I'll just add like probably not triple X, but let's just put double Z at the end so that we know what it is. Okay. So that way I know that that's my skeleton. Just because I have a bunch of these ALA rigs in this file already, so I want to make sure that I don't mix them up. Okay. And then I could go to my conversation, animation, click on any one of these uh, motion capture files, right click, retarget anim assets, and I could duplicate anim assets and retarget. So here you can see that it is give, showing me a list of all the skeletons I currently have in my scene. So I'm going to press this one here, the double Z. I'm going to put a prefix on it. That way I know that this is the one that I just did. Or when you're doing tests, like I'll name it, you know, test A1. That way I know what, what it is. And I don't want to put it in that same folder as my other mocap because this has been retargeted specifically for the ALA rig. So I'm going to retarget it and place it in my delete, delete two folder. And the reason why I'm putting it in a delete folder is because this is actually our work file. Like this is where we're doing our thing. So I need to know where I'm putting this so I could get rid of it later. Okay. So we have our prefix. This is where this new retargeted motion is going to go. So basically meaning it's going to grab this animation. It's going to retarget everything for our, our girl character and save it in a different file. So if I press retarget here, it's done. Okay. So now let me just get rid of this for a second. Let me just drag her in here. And you can see I can drag her into my sequencer. Go to track animation. And there you could see a la ZZ conversation. And when I press play, she's animating. Okay. She's going really fast for some reason. I'm not sure why the animation is very fast, but it's not a big deal. The cool thing is I could just go to the property settings of the animation clip. So you can see this is kind of like working with Premiere. You're just moving this time slider around. So I'm just going to set it, snap it to zero, zero, zero. And I right click on it and go to properties. And I could just go to my uh, play rate and set it to like 0.5. So now it'll play at half the speed. And if I press play now, you can see that it looks better. Now, mind you, this, the clothing is not rigged at this moment. So it's going to look, as you can see, terrible, right? So we're just focused on the body, not on the clothing. Okay. So we got this to work. And again, the blend shapes are coming later. And the cool thing is technically you'd be able to just have a clip like this of just face stuff and apply it on a separate layer like Photoshop essentially, but with, with animation. So you're like, it's like layers of life, which is pretty incredible. Okay. So that's cool. The problem is this clothing situation that we have here, right? The clothing situation right now, we our, our original SIM is this really nice mocap SIM uh, that Tran had done in, um, Marvelous. In Marvelous Designer. Yeah, I was just reading some of the comments. Uh, in Marvelous Designer. And that, you know, it's a fully uh, dedicated program for just cloth sims. And I was hoping that maybe we could come up with something in here to kind of automate it. But I'm not sure yet. Uh, but I'll show you how you could go about if doing some sort of a sim if you, if you wanted something like this. Uh, and why we think that we're going to end up not using this. So what you want to do is you can just come up to your, your rig here, right? I'm just going to drag this one over here. And I'll just double click on it. 
and I could just click on the clothing. Okay. And basically I could just right click and go to create clothing data from selection. There it is. And press create. So the setup is not so hard. It's just the quality of the sim uh, is not totally there for, for me. And then we could just go into activate cloth paint. We're going to click on this right here. And you can see how all the vertices turn purple. And purple, for some reason, represents like zero. There's no influence at all. Okay, so I could come down over here. And this is not going to look good, okay? So I'm just showing you what you can get from this. And then I'm going to show you like what we ended up doing uh, ultimately. Uh, so I could increase the radius to something like 8. Uh, you can see the strength is currently set to 0.5. So let me just set it to 1. And I'll just turn around over here, and I could just start hitting this with the brush. And since we know this is not what we're going to ultimately use, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'll just show you some of the tools here, and you can play around with this if you want, but uh, I'll, it'll be pretty clear why this is not the solution we're going to go with. I think this is an amazing solution if you have a character that has a cape or that has a trench coat and you just want like the back of the trench coat to flap around or something simple or a very long dress and you just want the ends of the dress to flap around. Um, so now you can see that we have uh, an influence of one here and there's nothing here. I could set this to smooth. Um, I could increase my strength on my smooth. And then I could just smooth, uh, basically flood this. So I'll set it with something like this. Um, OK, so I'm going to deactivate cloth here, the cloth paint. So I'm not deactivating the cloth, just deactivating the cloth paint. Right click and apply clothing data a la rig 01. Give it a second. OK. And you, yes, that is actually normal, what you're seeing there. And it'll, it'll make sense in a second. It goes back to the capsules that I was showing you guys earlier. Remember, it's using like a simplified geometry for the collisions. So I could save this. I think I might have saved it already, but let me save it again just to make sure. OK. I should have done this here because saving takes a moment. But if, you, if I come over here to the mass properties, you can see if I go to density, I put my mouse over the density. It's giving me all these values, like melt on wool, heavy leather. So you could change the settings of this to try to get a thicker looking uh, fabric. So currently, I have it set to 0 0.3. This is definitely going to be heavier than that. I'm actually going to bring it to 1. Uh, and I'll press Save again. So it's going to take a second, so I apologize for that. But this is pretty uh, uh, important. Let me see. Hello, I'm a 10th grade from India. I have made some marks. Uh, so question here while this is saving. I'm in 10th grade from India. I have made some models. I'm planning to graduate. I am assuming to go to Noman's suggestions. I just work on your your real um, and you know, focus on your anatomy and your traditional art, and that's probably the best way. But um, seeing mocap linked to any model for the first time will always look amazing to me. It it still looks amazing to me. I think this is the, the closest that a man will experience to giving birth, right? Because <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Uh, so yes, I totally, uh, I totally feel you. So you could see. 
few things here. So if I create a sequencer here, because I, I, I don't have one, so if I just go to uh, Windows Cinematics and I just create a sequencer uh, and I create a level sequence here. So let's just go to uh, level sequence. Where the hell is my level sequence? There it is. Okay, so put that in there. Okay, and now I'll just throw these two in there. Well, let me just throw this one in there. Okay. If I press play, so track animation and I have uh, my mocap again. You're gonna notice that the clothing doesn't look like it's moving at all. So we have to select the clothing. Okay, and let's just come over here. Oh. And Let's turn on, where is it, our, our enable? Let me see where this is at. Where did it go? Hold on one second. Give me one second, I maybe dragged the wrong guy in here. Give me one second. I think I'm gonna drag the wrong one in here. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so it's my fault. So instead of, I'm, I'm like putting the shortcut, I'm doing enable, it's, it's update. So you can see it's uh, update cloth and editor. Uh, so it's just a stupid mistake on my part. So you could see now when I play it, the cloth is moving around, but it doesn't look great because we have uh, our physical asset here. So you can see now why that shape is like that. It makes total sense. So what you would have to do is basically rescale this guy to represent the size of the legs but you can see that you're pretty limited in the complexity that you're going to get because it's pretty simplified okay there's a couple of different versions and I'll show you some of them in a second so you can see I'd have to make this smaller Rotate it, place it in position. But you could see there's some serious limitations here. Again, if it's a cape, then this is fantastic because you just do the, a, a capsule for the back of the character. It's not a big deal, probably a perfect shape. But once you have all these folds and all this stuff, this is not enough. So there's a few different variations of a primitive. So you could come over here and set this to box and then generate all bodies. And you can see you've got boxes. You can have this uh, simple convex hull. So generate all boxes. And this one seems to try to take on the shape of the body a little bit better, but it's still not perfect. And you can see there's still some issues there. But you could adjust this in position, kind of move it to the side, but it's still not ideal. So you can see there's some weird stuff here. And a lot of this has to do with my painting weights. Like you can see this is right around where I stopped. But you can kind of see that this is uh, this sim is not as great as something we could get in Marvelous, especially with uh, transibility. Here's another thing I noticed. When you do any updates, you have to disable update animation in editor and then click it back on in order for you to see the update. 
that uh, of course drove me bananas when I started doing this because I'm like, why is it not updating? So, uh, but anyway, so we got the mocap to work. That's great, but we realized right away, okay, we have to get this mocap inside of Maya. Uh, that way, we could actually do a proper sim inside of Maya. Sorry, we could do the model in Maya, export it as an Alembic, bring it into Marvelous Designer, do the sim in Marvelous, bring it back into Maya, and then I'm going to show you guys how we could, if we wanted to stream it into Unreal, or how we could um, just export it as an Alembic file from Maya and bring it back inside, which is probably what we're going to do. But anyway, that was the first half of the week was just basically flirting with the idea of and this is wind by the way which you we could lower this but uh you could just see the capsules are not going to work especially with the amount of objects that we have overlapping it just seems like it's going to be a nightmare yeah we have a lot of layered cloth yeah and it it's like like what miguel was saying it works on something like a cape um cape has just one piece mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah the other problem we have is if this doesn't work for whatever reason, there's not a lot of fiddling to fix it. Like there's not like grabbing and pulling it, which is something you could do with Marvelous. So um, anyway, we decided, okay, we need to figure out how to get a proper pipeline and get all this stuff to work in Maya. We know this works. And I actually like this cloth sim for fabric and whatnot in the village. So let me see if anybody's uh, asked any questions. Can we uh, scale up the, I don't know if we can. Yeah, we can't because um, we have a few yeah. layouts. If if we do this one, we'll just be covering. Well, I mean, the screen looks bigger. Yeah, but you just. We, we cover some of the. We cover this content. <laughs> so that, that layout we have is the best option to show everything. Yeah. So. Okay, um, so that's that. So that didn't work. We have the, the cloth. I do want to use this cloth, though, for the, for the town, um, for flags and stuff like that. I think it is very powerful. Just I don't think it's going to be useful for this. Okay, so let me just get rid of... Uh, actually, this is something you want to do is I'll go to my rig here. Once you know you're not going to use the sim, just right click and remove clothing data. That doesn't mean it's not going to be there still. This is not deleting it. It's just, it should really be called like disable. Okay. But so you know. And again, you could apply this to flags and whatever, which is great. Just for our main characters, it's not going to work. And especially for the character we're going to show you later today. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So that's where Maya came in, okay? And this is our default rig in Maya, which was rigged by our friend uh, Stefan, who we hope to get on the podcast one day. We actually met him at a Nomen live event in Australia. And we've actually been working with him for years. We've worked with him on commercials, on music videos on everything. We just keep hiring this guy that went to one of the Nomen events. I believe he was a student at the time and uh, he's been amazing. Um, I use him as much as possible. He's a great guy. So he rigged this and this is still, there's still, like I said, the clothing at this point. He said, let me just put some temporary weights on this because I assume that um, he thought that we were going to end up simming it anyway, so he didn't want to spend a lot of time on waiting it, and he was right. But uh, everything else is working perfect. There's a couple of things we're still doing on the arms, but uh, the rig for the most part is working well. So I just wanted to show how would you get mocap data in here. Uh, so this is the way this is the way we have to do it. So we have to go over here to this human IK setup. This little interface here. And we're going to go to our create character definition. No, I don't want to cover it. Uh, 
So, so we're going to go to create character definition. Okay. Sorry, someone was just asking me a question. So, uh, and you can see that we have this uh, map here that pops up on the right hand side, which is a cool little interface. And let me pull this up here. And I'm going to go to show and I'm going to hide everything. And I'm going to only show my joints. So I'm going to set this on and you can see that nothing appears. And that's because my display joints are in a display layer and they're hidden. So I have this here. Last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the show NURBS curve so I can see my controls. But I'm not going to turn them on yet. Okay. So I go back to my human IK here. Okay. So this is similar to the thing that we had in Maya, in, sorry, in Unreal, where we double, where we clicked on the skeleton and we basically mapped each thing, each bone to another bone. It's exactly the same process, but it's just being done inside of Maya. I like this interface. It's very clean. Uh, so is the Maya one, but I actually like the Unreal one a little bit better because there's less... Uh, chances of error because you're just seeing names but so the way it works here is we just double click on a bone like this right here and then we go hey this bone here that i just double clicked it's this one here as, as soon as i do that you can see that it automatically selects the one on the opposite side okay double click the shin select here great if this goes wrong, 99% of the time is human error. Um, so you want to be very careful while you're doing this, okay? So there's our left foot, double click. Make sure selecting it. And you can see that when you do select it, it's telling you what it's selecting. This is what it's named in the human IK node, meaning this here, but it's selected your foot left okay so that's great all right so we come over here and we have our hips double click double click great come over here our upper arm double clip lower arm double click our arms you could see how there's these little arrows here and they represent all the fingers. Most mocap data, especially the one I'm gonna be showing today, does not have hand animation. So I'm gonna skip this for now because it's not gonna make a difference. But just so you know, it would be the exact same process. You would literally come over here, double click on this uh, bone, and then click on the bone over here. But again, we don't have this. So I'm gonna skip it for now, okay? Next up, you can see we have a spine bone. Double click it, select this guy right here. So you can see all of these guys are turning green. There's a little drop down underneath and you can see that we have a ton of spine bones. Now you might think, why would there be more spine bones if we just selected one spine bone, this guy here? This part's a little bit tricky. So you always select the first one here outside of the drop down. And then you go inside, do not select this guy again. Double click him, and we go to the second one. Double click this one, and we go to the third one. And that's it for our spine. One, two, three. Okay, come out of that. We go to our clavicle. So you can see we have our left clavicle. Click on this guy. Okay. It automatically, this is a little bit tricky, when you go into these subfolders, subfolders meaning these guys here, you can see that when I selected him, all of a sudden it jumped to the window of the other side. I understand why they did that. I guess it's for you to make sure that the thing on the other side is mirrored because you can see that it is selecting it automatically for you but it gets really easy to mess up while you're dealing with hands because it's jumping from one hand to the other hand, to the other hand. So it's very easy for you to select, let's say double, double click on, on this finger here, 
And then you go, okay, I'm ready to do it. Select this guy. All right, cool. But then it jumps to the other hand. And the first couple of times you might do this, you might not understand why it's flipping the image over. You click on the next bone and you select this bone and you realize that it is now mapped to the wrong hand. So I wish that it wouldn't do that. So just so you know, be careful with that. So you can see the clavicles are set, spine is set. Let's do the neck. Double click the first one. Here we go. Double click the second one. Here we go. Our head, double click the head. And now we have the head selected as well. Last thing we want to do. Let's take a look at everything. We have our root, which is an unreal thing. Double click here. I think it's an unreal thing. I've never seen it before I started using unreal. You can see that now everything is green except for these guys here. And there's an exclamation mark. So you might be thinking, hey, what the hell? And you could see the status here says the right arm doesn't seem to be parallel to the x-axis. And the left arm doesn't seem to be parallel to the x-axis. So we need to fix that. And what does that mean? Remember when we were in Unreal and we came over here to the skeleton and I told you that um, when we went to the retargeting manager, how we had to get the skeleton to match more or less the, the angle of the arms of the other skeleton that we were going to rig. It's basically that exact process, but just in Maya. However, it doesn't want you to do it to another exact skeleton or another skeleton in particular. It wants every skeleton to be T-posed, okay? meaning the arms extended out to the side. It does not want a poses, okay? So it doesn't care whether your other skeleton has an A pose or not. It wants everything to be T pose, which is kind of a pain in the butt. So it will not show you the go ahead or will not give you the go ahead until you have these arms completely parallel to the X axis. So I can't move these here because these are connected to my control uh, curves. So I have to come over here. And to expedite this, I've already wrote down the attributes that I actually want. So you can see I could go to my rotate, set this here, do the same thing on this side. Okay. Then I could go to my Y, select this here. And I'm just straightening out the arms. up this guy here so let's do our z-axis if anybody's uh asking questions i'll reply in a second just right now um my brain is trying to not mess this stuff up so we have that right there this one over here make sure you do it on control curves uh, You can see we're just straightening out the arms. You could obviously manually do this, which is what I originally did, just by grabbing this and rotating. But uh, you know, to get the exact value, could take a little bit of time. So since I already know what the values are, I might as well just paste them in there. Paste that in there. Now we go back to human IK. We get our check mark, we're good to go. So that's awesome, okay? Let's come over here and rename the character to Allah. That way we know what is what when we come to this next step here. So let's just do a real quick uh, check. So shin, shin, thigh, thigh, hand, hand. Forearm, forearm, upper arm, upper arm, the head, the 
hips. Clavicle. You've got to be super careful with this stuff because if you mess this up, um, things are going to look ugly very fast. Okay? So everything looks fine. So I'm just going to click on this guy here, which is my IK uh, settings here. I'm just going to make sure that I have this set to FK. So you should do the same thing on yours. And I'll select my root, my root controls. And I'm going to press this guy here, which is create custom rig mapping. And I press that, and it brings me to another window that has nothing on it. So the definition is where you're setting the individual bones, OK? Whereas the, the custom rig now is where you assign the controllers, basically these NURBS curves, to a custom rig that it is creating on top of it, like a, um, a Maya neutral rig, so that way it knows how to transfer from rig to rig or whatever, whatever. So, okay, that's fine. So here we would select the control rig, which is the NURBS curve, rather than the bones. Right click, assign selected, click on this guy here. Make sure you're careful with this stuff because I was not a few times. I found that when this doesn't work, it's always one reason you messed up. So assign selected effector, click on this guy here, right click. Assign selected uh, effector, okay? Let's go to the feet. Make sure you're selecting the feet and you're not accidentally selecting anything else. Right click, assign selected effector. See it turns green, this guy here. Right click, assign selected effector. Okay, our hips. Right click, assign selected effector. Let's go into our spine, right click, assign selected effector. If you ever lose track of where the hell you're at, don't just go nutty. Click on this again so that you see what you selected last time. Okay, cool. This one here, right click, assign selected effector. Chest is this guy. You can see that's another place I could have messed up. I could have thought, oh, I have one more of these guys here. This is your chest here. Right click. Let's make sure. There we go. Right click. Assign selected effector. Okay. Zoom in. Upper arm. Right click. This is an easy one to mess up if you accidentally get it too close to your clavicle. Right click. Assign selected effector. Click on this guy, right click, right on the forearm, assign selected effector. Let me double check this. That's good. That's good. Click over here, right click, assign selected effector. You can see this is not the most fun <laughs> of episodes, but hey, this it's, thing, I think it's pretty important to show yeah. like how each step is. Yeah, this stuff. Uh, so freaking important if you're trying to get this process rolling. So assign selected effector, click on this guy here, right click, assign, da, 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 <laughs> assign selected effector, uh, this one here, right click, assign selected effector. All right, now we have our clavicles, this one here. Be careful, don't accidentally assign it to the arm, assign selected effector this clavicle here. You can see it is not mirroring it. It doesn't care. It wants you to do it. Let's make sure we did these guys good. Our neck. Right click. Assign selected effector. Right here. Right click. Assign selected effector. Come to the head. 
sometimes I just deselect everything just to make sure, okay, am I getting a little sloppy here? Right, uh, select this, right click, assign selected effector. So now everything seems to be working fine, okay? If anything is was done sloppy, that would be the reason and you would just have to go back, you could go back as much as you want and change this. So if you accidentally selected something, the next step you would see like one arm, you know, completely interpenetrating her head or whatever, you would know, oh, this is not working, okay? Very important that you name your assets, like I said, rename it, name it Allah, name it whatever, the, whatever you want. And I'm gonna set this to none. And when I set this to none, I could do many things, but the thing I'm gonna do right now is import animation example. This is just a canned animation uh, file that it's gonna give you just for you to see how something looks, okay? And it's some guy doing fighting moves, okay? Under character, set this to Allah. And under source, dummy fight. You can now hide the dummy fight. And they're fighting. And so you could see if that happened, something along the way got messed up. Usually what that is, what I've noticed, if that happens, it is always this guy here. So let's go back to this. Set this to stance. Right click. We have to unlock this. Right click, clear. Double click. Huh. So it's still some something in my skeleton is acting up. So we just have to find what that is. Okay. So let's go back to our stance. I've noticed this happens a few times and I had to uh, do this more than once. So let's just double check the feet. So that's fine. That's fine. This is fine. This is fine. I'm going to clear this again. Uh, so I, I had this happen a few times. And when I just kept rebuilding it, it worked fine. So let's just look at our custom rig again, just to make sure. And it's a good thing when it doesn't necessarily work right away, because um, that's reality. Okay, so let's just uh, clear it. Select this guy. So you can see it's pretty tedious. This is not the sexy, uh, the sexy fun episode. This is a, a tedious process. Um, but this, whatever happened, is. Uh, I can, yeah, I can totally phone. see why the, the menu in Unreal is just, yeah. you just, you're not doing it by pictures. Yeah. You're just going, okay, this matches. And you can see it works now. Yeah. Do I think that I did something wrong? I, you guys saw I was being very careful. It didn't look like it. But yeah. for whatever reason, knowing how to debug something is part of the process. And that's part of the process. You can see there it's acting up. It might be because I'm moving through the timeline pretty quickly. I'm not sure. I think that's just a display problem because you can see it's actually there. So, um, I noticed that too. Yeah. When I when I bring in a Lumbix, sometimes you just have to restart. Yeah. So um, let's do the next step here. So she's working fine. So now we have this here. Let me uh, turn on everything. Okay. So the next step 
is we just come over here and I'm going to go to, um, well, there's a few things I could, I could do. So let me just bring that guy. Um, I should have done it real quick here. Okay. So when you're, when you're ready, you could just come over here, click on this, and you go to bake, bake custom rig. When you do that, it's going to run through the entire animation and bake out the entire animation file. Okay? So let me just get rid of this stuff in the, in the meantime. Let me go to our display. Let me just hide this for now. So now we have the animation baked out. And if I wanted to, I could make any kind of changes on this. So let me just set this, my FK back to MK to IK. And I have to set this setting here that follows it. Okay. So now you can see she's doing her thing. And what's amazing is let's say, for example, I have a polyplane like so. And I create polysphere. Have something like this. Remember, this is mocap data, but I might have her on a shot where there's a rock on the ground. Now I'm like, crap, do I uh, get rid of the rock because she's interpenetrating the rock, right? Let's do it like this. So the great thing about this is I could select this here, go under my animation, create an animation layer, add selected object, and I could just reposition the foot here and now you can see that it lands on top of the rock okay and we're not going to get into like fine tuning this so it doesn't slip around because you could just basically copy this key and then just paste it all across here but you can see how freaking powerful that is because now we're able to adjust all the mocap data and make this do whatever we want like yeah. right now she's doing this boom 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 but we want her to be maybe looking at us the whole time. Right? Obviously, you can see at a certain point her neck breaks, but we could just do this. Put this over here. So from editing mocap point of view, this is extremely powerful. Yeah, super powerful because... Um we'll probably be capturing all this stuff on very flat ground, like extremely flat, even ground. And if you look at our environment, some of our stuff has like flat, perfect ground because it's all natural environments. Yeah. And you really want to have the contact of the foot on the floor. So, yeah. Yeah. Let me see. Uh, let me just read some of the comments. What is the right age to start CGI? Well, I wish I was your age when I started CGI. I'll tell you that. There's um, no wrong age. Yeah. It's just whenever. Yeah. Whenever uh, you want to start. You say fight moves, but I see someone aggressively putting books back on the shelf. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, so I got here, Tad, later. You, are you able to see basic mode? Uh, so hold on, let me see. Let me see the question. So JD Smith. So I got here, Tad. Late. Are you able to do basic rig mocap via human skeleton, and then expand on that and make it a fully customized rig? Uh, you can have. So what you want to do is that the, you can, but what, what I'm doing is I already have a rig. What this thing does, the human IK, or how I'm using it, I should say, is to make a neutral kind of system that I could bring in mocap from anywhere and apply it to this character. So you go to Mixamo, you could just drag Mixamo files in here. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. 
you could grab mocap data. So we're going to be using an XSense suit, grabbing the XSense data and applying it to here, grabbing uh, files from Marketplace that are mocap data and applying it to the model. So it's just being able to do any any of this stuff. So let me show you like what's pretty cool about this. Like if I come over here and let me just open up before I did this little tweak here. So if I go on the Mixamo website and I download any one of these files, let's say uh, Action Adventure Pack. Well, that one's like 22. So this one here. Okay. So I could just come over here and press download. I'm working at 24 frames per second with skin, without skin, because I don't care about that. Just go to download. Let me save this in my folder. So you can see it's called punching.fbx, okay? So you have, this website is amazing. If you don't know it, there's just, uh, I don't know, millions, but there's thousands of, uh, I, I so exaggerate, like, but, <laughs> but uh, there's, there's a ton of There's a ton, yeah. There's thousands of, uh, of different animation sequences and you can put anything and it'll give you some sort of uh, mocap for this. Uh, so you can see defeated, all kinds of great stuff, okay? But we just got this one. We just downloaded it. And if you want to, you could adjust the overdrive. So you can make it faster. You could make it slower. But I rather do these things inside of Maya. Okay. And I'll show you how. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close this file for a second and just have a neutral file. And I'm going to go to File, Import. And I'm just going to find the file I just brought in or that I just downloaded. So I'm just gonna go to FBX. You can see punching.fbx, okay? I could, you can see that I have a bunch of other ones there. So I'm gonna make sure everything is deselected. I'm gonna go to frame negative 10. Okay, I'll go to frame negative 10, select everything, and set the rotation to zero. This is a little bit funky. Um, you sometimes have to just do this through the outliner. So let me just do that. Okay, and I'm just going to add a keyframe. You can see I have 10 dead frames of it going from T-pose to fighting, and that's fine. Go to human IK. Make sure everything is deselected. Create character definition. Okay. Uh, I'm going to come over here to open. And you can see that it's going to say, you must select at least one bone in the skeleton before you can use a mapping template. I'm going to just double click on the thigh, select this, go to open and use the default HIK. Press OK. OK. You could see this is something that threw me off at first, just so you know, when I when I would do this, I'd be like, oh, my God, why is it giving exclamation mark again? Make sure you're doing the next step, frame zero, where he's in a T pose. Okay. Now, come over here. And you can, at this point, save this out as whatever you want. Okay. So you can see if I look over here in my other files, I have like sword is him just fighting with a sword. I have him, these are all from Mixamo, waving. Okay, these are all just downloaded off Mixamo. 
So now what I could do is go back to my file of my Ala character. So I have this. Let's have everything visible. I'm going to go to File, Reference Editor. Okay. So I'll just bring in, uh, let's say, the sword one. Come over here, sword. And now she's fighting with the sword from a Mixamo file. If you don't like that one, go back to your reference editor. I'm using reference editor instead of importing it. That way I don't have a bunch of uh, garbage in my file. I'll just go to reference, replace reference. I can go to waving. So we saw this one. Okay. And there you go. If you love that, come over here, bake, bake to custom rig. It'll now bake it onto your animation. So you can see there's now keyframes for every single frame. And now you could go in here. Go into your animation layers. And we could have her looking to the side the entire time. She's uninterested in, in you guys. She's looking off to uh, the horizon or she doesn't want to be there. She's mad at her parents. She hates her aunt that she's being forced to say hi to. Do you see how cool this is? It's extremely powerful. Uh, you're layering your mocap with extra detail. And um, it's, it's pretty non-destructive because you have everything there. Now, what's even cooler is I could select my root here. And I could come over here to my animation time editor and go to my add selected content from scene. Okay. So uh, I'll apply it and close. Now you can see we just have this like on a separate window here. I'm going to hide everything except for polygons. So now this clip here is starting to look a lot like this clip here. Remember these guys? How we could move this around. Whatever, we could retime it here because it's just looked at like, like a Lego block essentially. And I could do the same thing here. There's a couple of settings here where you could um, increase or decrease the time. You could trim it. Okay. You could move this around however you want. So you can see if I come over here to change playback speed, I just have some stuff in front of my monitor that's blocking my view. But if I come over here, you can see that now when it plays it back, it plays it much faster. I can make it smaller or shorter, I should say. Very fast. I can make it very, very, very slow. little passive aggressive there. Okay. And if you're happy with that, you can go to file, export selected. And this is really kick ass here. So we'll export this as an FBX. And we're going to go to capture thumbnail and play blast. Okay, minimize this. I'm going to frame this shot. Okay, 
I'm going to set this to play blast and I'll just press capture. So uh, let's do, it's probably because uh, my timeline is too, I stretched it out too much. So let's just do uh, 120 frames. Okay, so it does that. Do export. Uh, let me make sure my animation timeline is ex was selected. So file export selected. Okay, so we could just call this wave new export. It's writing it out. And now if I go to my content browser, just give me one second to, uh, to find this. Computer's going a little bit slow. Well, while that does that, let me just see if anybody's asked any questions. Just give me one second. How many displays do you normally run in production? I use two. Uh, Tranma, thanks for the tips on, uh, for substance students. I got it and it feels like I improved my work by 10 times. Yes, that's great. Alan David, hello. I never heard of that site, so cool. Yeah, you should definitely check out uh, Mixamo. It's pretty incredible, especially when you use it uh, with the techniques that we're talking about today. Okay, so here we go. So this is finally going. So let me just find rigs. Um, okay. So what you could see now is when you open up your your browser here you can see it's going really slow um so i have my rigs i have my mixamo tests and you should see you can see the thumbnail of what's what's happening there it's usually playing i think my computer is just dying so it's not playing but when you hover over it it should just play the animation so uh, yeah, I'm not sure why it's not playing, but my computer is having a hard time right now. But anyway, point is pretty awesome way because now you could have a bunch of thumbnails um, and it should all pop up pretty well. So, okay, so last thing, let me just close this up and show you one last thing, which I thought was pretty awesome. Okay, so we're back to this one here. Uh, I'm going to just throw on some animation on this. So let me just go to uh, none, or let me just import an animation that we like. So let's go to, um, my reference editor. And let's just do um, we'll do the catwalk. Okay, so there it is. So now I could set this to Hala, source of the animation catwalk, show none, show polygons. 
And now you can see that she's walking catwalk style. Okay. Now this thing is like mind blowing here. So if I come over here to my Unreal tab and I turn on Live Link, I'm gonna get this little window here. Okay, and you can see it says connected. So if I go over here to my outliner and I select my root joint, I'm gonna go to add to selection. Okay. And we'll just leave this alone for now. Come over here. Let's just close these guys up. That just means that it's in the... in the sequencer. So we'll just throw in the skeleton like so. And what we'll do here is I'm actually going to right click on this. Go to animation and go to animation blueprint. Okay, so this one is called Ala Z. Okay. And I'll just name this like Ala. Blueprint. I'll end up putting her in there instead of the other model. Okay. I'll double click on this animation blueprint. And I'll go to live link. And I'll plug that into that. And here, where it says live link subject name, I'm going to turn on the root. Okay. Now, if I go to Maya, And let's set the number of frames to like 50, 30, so that it loops quicker. Okay. We'll compile this and you can see she's now moving inside of Unreal. It is streaming the data over, okay? So now we have this model over here, but it's not playing in the viewport, which is what you actually want. So let's go into our details. We're gonna go to uh, add live link controller. Here, we set this to root, we set this to root. Update an editor. Let me see. What's going on here? Let me make sure it's playing in Maya still. Okay, that's good. Oh, let me see what's going on. There we go. So, and there we go. So now uh, all I had to do, it's weird because I had, I had turned it on, but I had to just turn it on and off again, which is our um, update animation and editor. And now you can see that we're streaming this real time from Maya. So you could literally have this on one window have this on another window and change any of the settings here. So if I baked this out and I wanted to adjust the animation, I would actually be seeing it in here. It stopped because it stopped here. But um, this would be a great way of you to 
have your entire Unreal scene on this window in with all your props and your lighting and whatever, and you might have some sort of a complex floor, you might not have the exact same complex floor inside of Maya, but as you're adjusting any of the joints or whatever to get them to line up with the set, you might not see it in Maya, but if you have two windows open, you'll be able to just zoom in to that foot in here and then zoom in in Maya to that same foot and make any changes that you want. And it's going to be updating inside of Unreal in real time, which is pretty uh, insane. So yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, you can see some of it is a little bit finicky. Um, some of it, as you saw, there was nothing wrong. It was just a matter of turning the settings on and off. And this is even in like, uh, if, you, if you've used the light uh, mixer, there's a couple of settings here where you have to just turn it on and off. So it's just a lot of that. So sometimes you'll think like, oh my God, it's not working. It's actually working fine. You just have to uh, turn it on and off. So um, but yeah, that's the, the pipeline that we're gonna be using. Um, this was a huge uh, learning experience for myself. And yeah, that's what we're going to do. So uh, hopefully this helps anybody that is trying to jump in and trying to get all this stuff to work. So remember, the clothing will be simmed separately. Um, oh, let me show you one last thing. This is actually really cool. So one of the things that we really wanted to do is to try to get a stop motion feel with these characters. So right now, when you look at this mocap, it looks cool, but it looks kind of like mocap. It's kind of perfect. So I wanted to get some flaws in it. I wanted it to feel like stop motion animation. Again, the face is not animating yet, so uh, that'll be a separate thing. But uh, one of the things that makes stop motion look like stop motion is it's shot in twos, which means every frame is held for two frames. So even though it's 24 frames a second and there is still 24 frames a second, each picture is held for two frames right so there's a jerkiness there and i kind of want that effect right there's also no in between motions with stop motion that's why there's no motion blur because there is no uh movement while the shutter is open right the shutter is taking a photo shutter's taking a photo shutter's taking a photo uh so we want to be careful with our motion blur but we also want that jitterness so how could we do that Okay, so if I grab this and I bake this out, I'll bake this whole thing out here. We have all our animation here. What I saw, what I thought was really cool is if I hide this, and let me just go to my NURBS curves, which are basically my curves that are driving the character, and I go to my animation graph editor, and I have this crazy mess. Well, if I select everything here and I go to my curves and I go to resample curves and I set this to two, it's going to keep every keyframe for the two seconds, like I, sorry, two frames like I want. However, it's still going to do in between. So if there's one shot, one uh, pose here, and then one pose here, it will try to figure out the motion in between. I don't want that. I want it to jump, like stop motion. So what I could do is then select all of these curves and set them to step tangents, like so. And then when I play this back, you could see you're gonna get much more of a stop motion feel. I don't know if it's clear through uh, the stream. I mean, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. But you could see it is much more uh, staggered. So I could show you an, another example here. So, um, The jump was uh, one that I really liked. So this one here. Let me 
Okay, so this one's already been converted, and you can see the one on the right has regular mocap, and then this has that filtering effect on it. And you could see how the one on the left feels much more correct or much more like mocap. It's just going over the frame rate. Yeah, I'm not sure. It just, just looks like playback problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Let me open another one because I have a bunch of them. Because we've been we've been playing this thing all morning and it worked fine. So um, I think you just have to restart Maya when yeah. it does stuff like that. So let me show this one. Same same process. The one on the left has uh, the stop motion uh, filter. I call it a filter, but it's not really a filter. It's it's just a process to get. Uh, the step tangents, but you could see she feels much more stop motion-y. Okay, and I'll show the very last one. Could definitely feel it there so yeah so that's it that's what i wanted to go over today um i'll pass it over to tran and she'll show you some of the cool stuff she's been working on so on our end it's more of this debugging and figuring out how to get the pipeline to work uh because the next thing we hope to start showing you guys uh maybe not next week but having actual shots so um yeah okay so i'm taking over um, just give me one second. Uh, so with the time left, I want to cover um, a character that I was working on this week. I mean, I did a few things this week. Um, this was one of them. So this is an animal based on an anteater, right? So here's like some of my reference. And I was looking at different uh, types of anteaters, there's a giant anteater. And then of course there's like the lesser one, the collared ones, and they look pretty cute. Okay, and we looked at a few other things and we decided anteater's pretty cool. Um, so I went here and I came in and I sculpted it. And I feel like, you know, from here, I know, you know, artistically you wanna do a couple approaches. So, of course, what we're doing is stylized. Uh, I, f I felt if I just leave it like this kind of clay look, um, I'm not really taking it as far as, as I could. Um, so I thought about like other options, like how can I make this a little bit more interesting? So if you look at certain things in stop motion, um, these are just images from other shorts or, or movies uh, and you can see that they use cloth a lot this one here looks like it's really all cloth um, and these ones here all look like they're made out of felt now i did think about felt but i don't think that's our look right like really the way felt was being used is is used as the surface right like that's for example like the skin um so I thought like, yeah, let's not do that look because that doesn't match with what we have on the other characters. But I did think, you know, saying looking at something like this was just purely fabric and it looks like a thin fabric that this could be a really cool look. Now, if we're going to fabric, it becomes a cloth simulation and we never want to make anything that we can't actually sim. So in Marvelous, you can make something really crazy and complicated um, as a still, and it will look cool, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna actually sim. All of a sudden you start trying to simulate it on top of animation, um, and then your cloth is like going bonkers, it's colliding, crashing, it just doesn't function. 
right? So anything that we make, we want to make sure that it's going to work. So what I did is I got a dog um, from CG Trader that had a walk cycle, right? So this is not what we're going to use as an actual animal. It's like R&D. Yeah, so it's like R&D. Uh, I cashed out as a lumbic file. I brought it in. Um, and I basically made what I was trying to do, which is a cloth body. And I want to really do these kind of um, cloth hairs. I guess that's what you call them <laughs> on the back. So if you look at some of these ant eaters, they do have like hair coming out the top. Now, some you know they also have this bushy tail. So the ant eater that I made, uh, it's not 100% accurate. Obviously, it looks like you know some stylized version. So I just wanted to make like an interpretation of this, right? I think it would make it more exciting. Um, it's also not easy to make cloth stand out. So I want to talk about some of the properties uh, that I did to make it work. So let's just play. Okay, so we see it working. And I like the way um, the spine hair is working, working and then the way that the cloth deforms looks pretty nice. So now that I know that we can actually achieve this, because I don't really necessarily know a lot, um, most of the time, if you're simming uh, pieces like this, like these strips, they'll just like fall flat. They'll just kind of collapse. They won't stay upright. So I had to do um, some customization on it, which I'll go over in a second. Um, but based on that, like we're like, okay, this is gonna work. This could look pretty cool uh, once we have the ant eater rigged um, and some animation we can sim. So what I did end up making here, and I don't have simulation for this, is something like this. Okay, so you know some of the pattern of the ant eater, like this here. You can actually see, you know, being incorporated to the cloth. So this is, you know, going to have a clay head here, and then the rest of the body would just be cloth simulated. And I think this looks much more um, integrated. Once we texture this. Um, Hopefully it should all look, well, it should technically look way better than this. So this is all Marvelous Designer, right? So they're both Marvelous Designer. I just have two instances open, one with the dog and one without. Now, the one thing I wanted to cover is, well, one, I wanted to talk about... Marvelous Designer. Yes, but I want to talk about like what properties I added onto this. But I'm like, well, if I jump into that, it's super advanced. So I actually kind of want to go over like an inter, um, introduction to Marvelous, right? So let's just say you're brand new in Marvelous and you've never touched it before. Um, that kind of inter introduction. I'm going to just delete this. Okay. So assuming that you're brand new and you never touch Marvelous and you already want to give it a try, right? Obviously, the software costs money. Um, there is a 30-day trial. You just search Marvelous Designer. You can try out for 30 days, and they do have different pricing, like uh, monthly subscriptions and stuff like that, right? So you can go ahead and download and try this out. Um, in Marvelous, you have basically two windows, 3D and 2D, right? Now, you have to look at this as if pretend you're a seamstress or something like that, right? So if someone who's a seamstress makes clothing, they're not going to just, you know, make it in 3D. First of all, they're going to have some kind of cloth laid out flat, right? Um, and they're going to cut it up. So your 2D window is basically something like that. So up here, these are my tools. And these are my tools over here for 3D. Um, this first one here, or sorry, this third icon will allow me to create different cloth. And you can just click on this window. There's a little arrow. It's a little hard to see but I can make different types. So if I want to make something circular, you can see I just draw a circle and it pops over here. Now, if I come back over here, I select this. This is like my selection tool, which will allow me to select the object. And then this one here um, gives me editing capabilities, right? So if you are you know, want to interpret this into something like um, Maya, basically this is like component mode. 
right? Where you can select an edge, move an edge. I can select something um, like a vertice and move it. And you can see how that changes the shape, okay? Now, if I want to delete it, I'm going to go back to basically object selection. So this will control my component modes, my vertices, my edges. This will go back to object mode. I can select it. Um, and I can do scaling and stuff like that with this. I can also just select this and delete it. Now, let's come over here. Let's just make a piece. Now, a lot of people um, that I know that use 3D for a very long time, they still can't get used to Marvelous because there's, you know, it does take knowledge in pattern making, but there's also probably some other mistakes that are happening that they're not quite aware of. And if you know this, this will change your entire life and your whole experience in Marvelous. Now, Marvelous is world scale size. Uh, and the size that you bring in or that you're trying to simulate on top of really matters. So um, let's say you just want to try out the first time and you want to bring a mannequin in um, or you just want to use their mannequin. So if I go over here up to this tab, it says library. I'm going to click on this and I'm going to go to avatar. So an avatar is basically a mannequin. Let's just load, go into female. Let's just load this one. I'm going to double click. And this figure is going to pop up. Now, you want to really simulate things at this scale, right? So I'm just going to delete this. If I create a cloth, let's see what happens when I do something too small. So if I create a little piece like this, and I'm not aware of this, a lot of people aren't aware that you can load something this, um, like an avatar in, and you can check your scale. And you're just working with a blank scene. And I want to simulate this. I'm going to press this little arrow right here, and it's going to sim. OK. So you can see right away that it's simming. And it really is a kind napkin. of, it's really weird. Yeah, it's like a napkin. But it also sometimes, um, it's not really, the gravity is weird. You can see how it drops. So if all of a sudden you, you start trying to make anything, it could even be a blanket. And you're just, you know, it flew off the screen, right? So that's what you're dealing with if you if you make something too small and you're going to have a very terrible time <laughs> doing that you're not going to know what's going on now what happened if we make something too big okay also notice here i have a, a representation the shape of the avatar which is really nice so it gives me an idea of like how big i'm supposed to make something right now let's say if i make something twice the size um and i hit sim you can see how slow that is, right? And then I can also pull it while it's simming. But notice how the cloth is really slow and very difficult to deal with. So if you start too big, you're going to also have a really horrible time. <laughs> and I've seen this a lot you know, with students. I, I do um, help them with Marvelous pretty often. And it's one of the first things I teach my students. So if I make a cloth like this size and I sim, you can see that it's much faster, OK? Um, so that's going to change a lot of things. Now, a couple other things you can do in Marvelous. Let's say you have this crumpled. You can, and you want to start over. Um, it's very hard to try to take this and pull it straight. You know, if I try to pull this straight, um, it's somewhat possible, right? But you know, it's like this. And it's really fussy. Uh, what I can do is hover over this, right click, and I'm going to reset this to 3D. OK, now it goes back to where it was before. Now, the other thing that you can do um, on this is you can actually uh, move and rotate. OK, so here, if I tap on this, and this is very strange, right? You see a blue dot pops up, and it pops over here. Your, your gizmo doesn't always pop up. You got to tap it again. And there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. That's just how this program is, right? Um, and you can see now I have this. And I can now pose my character. Now, depending on which version you're using, um, I think the latest version is corrected. But if you're using any other version, before it, your gizmo is usually set to screen coordinates. Um, you know, and I have students that 
start working with this, but this is really hard to move anything in. Like you have no idea how <laughs> you're supposed to move this thing, right? So what you want to do next, aside from understanding your scale, is you're going to go to your gizmo, you're going to set this to world coordinate. Um, and as far as how I'm navigating, I'm using Maya's navigation. You can also change this by going setting preferences. And we're going to go to preferences again. Uh, wait for this window. And under view controls, right? I'm going to try to read out the settings because the fonts are really tiny. Um, I have to set to Maya. Now, if you're not a Maya user, you know, you also have 3D Max, Wacom. I don't know what that is. Wacom Pen, uh, XP Pen, or Magic Mouse. I don't know what that is. Uh, I use Maya. So now my navigation, I don't have to learn um, new buttons, right? Which is really nice. So you can just change those settings. Okay. Now, as far as scale, there's a couple of things, um, the way we work, right? So if I'm, let me just do a new scene. If I'm working, I wanna make sure um, where I'm building my model and this could be ZBrush, but really Maya is more accurate on measuring scale. You wanna make sure what you're doing in outside program is gonna match. What I mean as far as what I'm making, I'm really referring to um, the avatar, right? Avatar basically means anything that's not cloth. So this is a garment and this is an avatar. The avatar can be the anteater, it could be a table, right? Um, in Maya, I'm gonna make sure and this is already default. Okay, so under settings, I'm using centimeters. So we're gonna do that. Now, whatever I'm making, I wanna make sure, uh, let's say I wanna make a table. So this is where your, your stuff can go wrong. So I'm gonna make a, a cube. And again, if you just bring it in like this, it's not the right size, right? So let's just say, you know, what's a tabletop surface? Uh, usually they are 30 inches off the ground. So 30 inches, I'm just quickly converting to centimeters. It's gonna be 62 centimeters. So I'm gonna create a measure tool, put it here, just do one here, that's 28. And I already can guess that my scale is really wrong. So let's set this to 76. Okay. So my table is gonna be this high. Uh, okay, this means that clearly my table might be this big. Okay. And now I'm just gonna export this as an OBJ. Let me just put a folder in here. I just call this table top. All right, so now I have my model. And of course your model could be way better than this. Could be a figure. Um, let's jump into Marvelous. And let's say I wanna import this. So I'm gonna delete this. And I'm gonna go file, import, OBJ. And I'm gonna find where I export that tabletop right here. And here, it's going to ask what I want to load it. So I want to open it. I want to set the object. You want to set it to avatar. Okay. Your scale on here is also important. So centimeters. Um, it's usually going to ask you about your scale three times. If you're loading Marvelous for the first time, it's going to ask you what scale to use. If you're a Maya user, it's always centimeters, right? Um, the next time it's going to ask is when you export or you import something, right? So it's always centimeters, 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 all the way through. And you, you can see I made sure in Maya that I did in centimeters. Now, if you're using a different program, I'm not exactly sure because I just basically use Maya. But you can work this out. Um, and knowing that it's important, um, I didn't know this when I first used this, right? Uh, but now I know. And as long as you know, you can figure out what your scale has to be. So I'm gonna say, okay. Okay, so it gave me an error. It can't fit anything because obviously it's a table. But now you can see my table and I can create a piece of cloth like this. 
and I can pose it over here. Now, the other thing that's really important to understand in, is that you want to make sure to ease it in. Um, cloth does explode in Marvelous. So normally what causes to explode, what I mean is the vertices start shooting out of place, is if you try to do it, make it do something really far from a distance, it's going to snap back at, like an elastic uh, rubber band, right? So, you know, what you don't want to do is like, I'm going to sim it down here and I'm going to somehow pull this up here. I mean, you can do that, but you can see it's it doesn't like that. like right and as soon as it starts sticking into something this is probably most people's nightmare <laughs> when they're first using this program right so you you can pull this out but that's not really how you want to deal with it um, the best thing to do is to turn off your simulation by pressing this arrow and let's say it wasn't a crumple mess necessarily uh, you can do one of two things you can just pull it out um, once your cloth is crashing to your avatar, you're in a situation where it's like bubble gum, right? As you can see. So you can see here, I have it pulled out. And now if I sim, um, it's now not so sticky, right? And as long as it doesn't stick, you can see how flexible it is. Okay, the other thing I could have done was what I did earlier, which is right click, reset, and just start it over again, right? And normally what I would do is something like this. I would just let it fall relax, and then I can direct it the way I want to be. So you have to treat it a little bit like, you know, um, delicately. The way I tell students is, it's like, just treat it like you're driving a car, an, an old car. You know, don't, don't make the old car do things that it shouldn't do, because it's not going to work out well, okay? Now, the other basic thing is, you might look at this here and go, hey, this cloth is not so detailed. So um, what am I supposed to do? Well, what you have over here is you have particle distance. So under simulation properties, uh, I know the font is super tiny. I can barely see it. Um, you have particle distance and it says 20. Now, particle distance is basically vertice distance. So if I go up here, this is my cloth icon, and I know it's super tiny. Um, I can turn on the wireframe like this, and you can see that it's simulating all in triangles. I think that's the best way to leave it. It, you know, you can force this to be quad. You're not going to have a good time. It doesn't sim as well. It really likes triangles, right? And if we look at this here, you can see um, there's points at each one, and that's the particle distance. Okay, so it's really trying to be uniform. So the distance between each point is at 20 millimeters. And if I actually decrease this number, it's going to make it more dense because the distance is going to be shorter. So now if I set this to 10, you can see now how much more dense it is. And let's turn this off here. So we're just not looking at that. Now, once you increase the or decrease the particle distance to up res your resolution, you want to let it sim like that, and you can see that we have more detail. Now, the lowest I tend to go is like around five. Right? Now, also notice here, it looks really nice now, um, but I'm feeling it delay. So if I try to adjust my cloth at this point, it starts exploding like this, right? It starts not liking it so much. So, and, and that's common. So you just don't fight it, right? It doesn't, you know, don't try to adjust things like that. What you have to do is you got to go back to your object, change your particle distance to workable resolution. Maybe you think 20 is too low. You can I can usually get away with 12. Sim this, and you can see how much more flexible it is. Now, um, you know, the lower it is, you know, the easier it is. You can go too low and not have this much detail. But you can see now... Um, if you know how to kind of manipulate your settings, you'll, you'll have an easier time. So your scale is important. You want to work low. And then at the very end, once you're happy, you're going to bring it up. Okay. What I mean is the particle distance. Now, what you can also do is uh, you have fabric properties, right? So by default, I have this property. You could change color. I never really apply any kind of um, textures onto this because, you know, this is not 
where things render for me. So I don't really care. Um, I want to use the color to know what different fabric it is. I can double click this and call it something else, literally, right? And you're gonna have a name. But now when I have this selected here, under properties, you can see my properties change, right? So if I have this selected, I have the property for this piece of cloth. I select this, I have the property for my fabric. Now, if you come all the way to where physical property is, you can actually change um, your setting. So uh, let's say I put trim full grain leather. That's a very firm leather, right? And I drop it on this. You see how it behaves very differently, right? It's very stiff. So I have like, I don't know, I guess maybe it's not quite a saddle, but like you can see it's very strong leather, right? So there's also different types of leather. This window is really tiny. I have leather lambskin, which is softer, has a few more wrinkles. And you can just play around with these. Um, some of the fur ones are new, right? If I set this to, let's say silk, silk is really super, super fine. And you can see how thin and small my wrinkles are. A lot of times you might see this, um, when someone's working, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube about Marvelous. Sometimes you just work with full grain leather because you can see there's less problems. There's less, less likely to crash. And at the end, when you're resting it on getting it where you want it to be, let's say you have something difficult that you're trying to wrap it around, you can then go and change your cloth setting. Now I can just make a new one by pressing add. And let's say my final one, um, this leather lambskin, and I want to change the assignment, I can just drag and drop it on top. And that's how I know uh, which one's working. It's, I just color code it. So that's how I generally work. Okay. Now, okay, I don't have a lot of time left. Um, let's get into another thing here, because this actually influences my fabric property. So I'm going to make another piece like this, and I'm going to let the sim on the ground. Also notice I am working in the center of my world, right? This is going off in tangent. If I, if I come over here, you can see this was in the center. So whatever program you're using, like if you're using Maya, um, it's gonna import right back on top as long as your scale is correct. You might have something in your scene where the object's this far. You can import that but your pivot will freak out, right? Um, meaning sometimes it loses orientation and it can't focus. So most of the time it's good just to put things in the center of your origin. Um, I never have a good experience if I'm trying to make something over here, like I have a hard time navigating after some point. Also looking here, um, Marvelous does recognize uh, normals, right? So if you look on this side, you can see that it's white, and this side is dark. So this is like, um, like, you know, the back normals. So if you don't know what that is, I mean, you know, same thing in Maya, right? You will have the back side, the negative normals, right? Or of that. Now, normally you don't have to think about that, but it does have an effect. So let me just drop this to the ground. Okay. And the property I want to introduce you to, I select, go into selection, select this cloth, I'm going to introduce pressure. So pressure is a way to get um, like pillows, quilted looks. And if I do this, let's apply this at two, it's going to fly up into the air because it's applying pressure. And I will just let it drop. Okay, so it came back down. Now, normally the way it's used is you never do it on a single side because it will do something like that. So you'd wanna sew it to another side. So let's do a quick sew. I'm gonna copy and paste this. Control Z, Control V. I'm gonna rotate it around. I'm gonna position this underneath and let's do, um, a simple sew. Now we can sew in here 
This is a sewing machine icon and you can sew in here. So it's no different, which, whichever one you want to sew in is wherever you're comfortable. Let's do in 3D. So I'm going to go to not edit sewing, but segment sewing, because I don't have anything to edit. And I'm just going to sew these two. Now notice that there's this little dash, right? Um, you want to make sure they're lined up correct. If they're incorrect, like where it's like this, you can see what it does is reverses my stitches. So that means this corner is sewn to this corner. So we don't want that. We're going to sew it like this. We're going to have straight lines. OK. And I'm going to drop this and let's sim. And it's now double sided, but flat. Now, if I select both of these and I add pressure, it won't fly away. The pressure is based on the normals. So when you saw it flying up, it was flying upward because this white part um, is the direction the pressure is going. And you can see underneath this is white. So if you apply pressure to both of them, they neutralize each other and it will just fill up. So maybe two, two is actually not very high. Let's do 10. And you can see now I have something like that. So that gives me a kind of pillow effect. Okay. Um, a couple other things, now that we know that one property, is, and this is foundational and important, it might seem like not necessary or, you know, going into too little details, but this has made a big difference in getting comfortable with Marvelous, is understanding weft and warp. Okay, so what is weft and warp? Let me just pull up my pure ref. Give me one second. And this will lead into how I dealt with my fabric properties. Okay. So weft and warp, if you ask anybody in CG who hasn't touched Marvelous, they're like, I don't know. But if you ask like someone who works with clothing in real life, they will know this because um, you know, seamstresses have to understand all this, all this stuff. So here, weft is basically uh, your horizontal direction of your thread, and warp is basically vertical. And the way I remember this is weft is like left, right? So then it's, if it's left, it must be horizontal. It's definitely not vertical. And that's how I remember it, right? So, um, and then there's just some other things like that, like that we don't have time to get into. Okay. So what does that mean for us? So let me make a new piece. Let's make it over here. And I'm going to make it long so that we can recognize the shape. If it's square, it will be a little bit hard um, to understand. And let's go to selection. So I have this selected. Now here we have shrink rich weft and shrink rich um, warp. And they're both at 100, which basically means 100%. OK. So you can resize these things and adjust your weft and the warp. Now, weft is, again, horizontal, right? Um, let me just lay it down. Let's do this on the floor. OK. Now, if I look down at this and I adjust my weft value, uh, I do 110. It's going to make it 10% wider. So let's sim this. And you see it grew 10% wider, right? And this is why I um, made it long so you can see. If I set this to 80, it's going to become 80% of this current size right here. And it becomes thinner. And the same thing if I do with warp, right? So I can make this um, 130. It's going to become 30% longer. OK. Now, you weft and your warp is determined the moment you create the cloth. So if I take this cloth and I rotate it 90 degrees, and I go, hey, I want to make this, I'm thinking I want to make this wider. So you come over here and you go 100, for example. It's still, you can see it's still working the way I created it. So your weft is determined the moment you create it. And I usually try to avoid rotating that because I won't remember that I rotate it and now my weft and my warp is messed up. Okay, so this comes down to 
some of the fabric properties. So this is a little bit um, much more advanced. Okay, so for, in order for me to get some of these things to stand out, uh, let's create a new piece. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I don't know how to do that button when you share comments. <laughs> press, it, press the comment. Press the comment. I think you have to be in the interface, not in the pop-up thing. Oh, I see. That's what it is. Yeah. Already, already, uh... Oh, I actually hit it. <laughs> OK, I'm going to leave that alone. I'll figure it out. Um, let's make another piece here. OK, so I want to make sure that this cloth could stand up a little bit more stiff. What I did was I started with trim full grain leather, which you can already see was pretty strong, right? And it's almost standing up, but it will still um, fold over and fall over at some point. So during simulation, I would expect it to just flop over after several frames, like you can see here. OK, let's just sim this again. OK, that dropped too fast. Let's just study this. OK, let's leave it here. Now, you can select this here. I'm going to color it pink. And under the preset, oh, it's wool. That's incorrect. I can open this here, and I can adjust these values, right? And this is where the bending weft and warp. And if you don't necessarily get all of this, that's OK. Um, but I do think understanding just the basic weft and warp is pretty important. Now, one of the first things I adjusted was uh, my density. So the density determines my weight of the fabric. So if I kind of want this to feel more floaty, so if I bring it down, you see, it's like floating in the air because I made my density really low, right, into zero. The next thing I want to do is I brought off my internal damping. What this does is it makes the cloth less bouncy, and it kind of acts like um, it's underwater, okay? So that's going to help. Now, when it's less bouncy and I drop this, as you saw, when I dropped it from a height, it, it curled up. But because it's not so bouncy, and it's really light, it won't do that. OK? And that helps give me certain settings. I don't think that you need to do this most of the time. Um, for most of the part, your regular presets will work. Um, this is only for special cases. Now, here, I just brought this all the way up, bending weft, bending warp, um, and bending bias. So they're under um, basically one control. And as far as what bending weft and warp does, right, uh, it just makes the resistance to fold, right? So this one is weft. Now your, it looks confusing. You can see how this one here. I'm going to wrap this up soon. I just want to bring up the Epic Pen. And let me just choose a hot pink color. OK, so we know weft is like left, right? And so it's, whoa, this is really fat. It's like this. So why is it affecting a vertical cloth? Well, because it's affecting all my threads. So meaning if I have a vertical or a horizontal thread that resists to fold like this, uh, eventually you're going to see the effect vertically. So there are just some things to get used to, right? Um, that's how that works there. And the other thing I adjusted after that is I just brought up the stiffness. OK. And the buckling ratio, I brought this all the way to 0. So buckling ratio, again, helps the cloth not collapse as much, right? So at 0, it won't collapse. Um, and the buckling stiffness, again, you can see here. And you can look this all up. They have this information. This is from their website. So they have a really great documentation for all these things. Um, once I have all this, 
The last thing I do to ensure it really stands up, because it still can flop over if you really push the animation. Um, if the animation is very dynamic, it can still collapse. So I, what I did is I grab this here, and I put air pressure. Now, once it's sewn to something, OK, let's say I, well, I don't have anything to sew it to, <laughs> that it's not going to move. Um, but basically, if it's sewn to something, it's going to stay latched, right? But you can see it's kind of flying, which worked out. At least I think it worked out. But yeah, it's not a normal behavioral cloth. It's, it's got a life of its own now. Okay, So this sums up just some of the basic stuff. Um, again, some of the cloth properties was a little advanced, but most everything up until before that, or I think um, a good way to start just understanding those things. Okay. All right, let's see the questions. Uh, I'm doing a competition. I need to make a race driver character. I haven't used Marvis for it. Do you think it would be faster to to learn it rather than sculpting the character from scratch? That's a tricky one. Um, for a lot of people, they rather like it. Really depends. Like if you're if you're a really amazing sculptor, then of course you're going to have an easier time sculpting it. If you've been using a sculpting program, it's just going to be easier. Usually, the very first thing you make is is really tough. So um, it's like growing pains. Anything I do for the first time always sucks. Uh, but after a few times, it's actually be faster. So for me, I would never choose to sculpt it. Um, my skills and like say ZBrush and Marvelous are fairly equal. So I would, because my skills in both programs are equal, I would just do it in Marvelous. Um, I do think it's worth learning Marvelous though, because it's a very um, industry standard for a character artist. You want to see? Yeah, it's good. So, uh, all right. So, are, are you done with the Marvelous? Thing? Yeah, so this is a good start. Cool. Uh, one thing I wanted to show, and then we're just going to wrap it up, is we were talking about this. It seemed like the computer was frozen. It actually, you can see it's working now. So, this is what your thumbnails would look like when you export the FBX. Uh, because we had slowed down the animation so much, there was a big lead time in the beginning, so it looked like it wasn't actually moving. So you see it when you put your mouse over it, but it's just something that you guys should should see because uh, uh, if you're dealing with a bunch of mocap clips, instead of, you know, you might not access a certain file for a year or two or whatever, I still use some elements that I shot eight years ago. And, you know, you're not going to remember what catwalk 47 is in five years exactly what it looks like but if you have a bunch of thumbnails you'll be able to just put your mouse over and see exactly what each clip looks like so you could uh you know you'll know whether you want to use it or not before you actually open the file but, but yeah but that's it so um that's it that's all we got for today uh like i said and like we've been saying from the beginning this is a journey that you guys are taking with us so some of the weeks are going to be a lot of uh stale just how do we figure out how to do this technical hurdle that we're not so sure of and there'll be certain weeks where it's all you know uh whipped cream and awesome looking images today was more you know the meat and potatoes i think yeah it doesn't seem as fancy or attractive but um i think maybe for some people but for for us and for me it, it makes it much more exciting because now we can have performances and start shooting. It's it's actually like the backbone. Well, um, you guys be talking about casting actors. Yes, actually, I, I could show you something very quick uh, before. Um, just give me one second. Let me just. Uh... So, in terms of casting, this is the site that we use which is called Breakdown Express, okay? Now, definitely want to give a warning here that you have to treat this site with respect.
because you are hiring people at this point, right? This is not a site that you go to put a job posting and dick around and waste people's time. These are working professionals that are living off of acting, but this is a site that we, uh, that we really like. So uh, you can see here, for example, we put up a, a posting for a certain off for a certain job. And then you can see that we have two different roles, Koa and Ala, and we have a, a, a brief description of each character. Um, if I come over here, because I didn't want to click on a bunch of um, images of, of people, let me just open this up. Meaning like maintaining confidentiality. <laughs> Yeah, just give me one second, I'll show you. But once I would click click in the next window, I would get something that looks like this. And you basically would get uh, a list of actors and actresses depending on the role that you're looking for. So I blurred them out here just because, again, I don't want to uh, say, hey, we didn't cast this person or that person, and they didn't agree to this. But you can see this for the role of Allah. And I think in, so far we've gotten 20, 30, so we've got 30, like 35, 40 people that have sub, uh, submitted just for Allah, which is a, uh, there's two roles. There's Ala and Koa. So we're looking for an African American actress in Los Angeles. Uh, so we actually have gotten some amazing replies. But again, if you use this site, you have to follow certain protocol. Don't go there to dick around. You have to pay people in order to do this. And you could ask the people to audition. They would send you a video submission, uh, which is the the whole ecocast, which is you requesting ecocast and they would send you a recording, you'd have to upload a section of your script and they would say, they would read it for you. Many times they would record it themselves and then they would send it to you via the site. You'd click on Echo Ecocast and you would see their submission. And then you could meet them in person and take it to the next step afterwards, but you could narrow it down really quick because once you see them reading uh, your dialogue, you'll know whether they, they fit the role or not. You could make certain tweaks to you could ask for certain changes and they'll do it and then you could take it to the next stage and and meet them in person or through zoom or whatever but this is an amazing site uh highly recommended but again remember you're not dealing with people's livelihoods so if you use it be very respectful of it and of people's times okay uh hining uh when are you guys opening a dealership and making classes this is it. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, if you want one in person, you have to ask a gnomon. Uh, but yeah, but this is it, Ricardo. I hope this helps. We'll get into this more once we actually, uh, we just put this out this week. So we're going to, we don't know who we're even uh, going to bring in at this point. But uh, great actresses in, in this round. Uh, we're very happy with uh, the talent we're seeing. So. Yeah, the worst thing you want to do when you're casting stuff is to cast your buddy that you know that wants to that one day dreams of being an actress because it's just going to be terrible and it's going to look like a bunch of 20-year-old. It's going to look like the equivalent of a bunch of 20-year-olds with fake mustaches acting like detectives. So you want to get professionals and this is a place where you want to put your money into. Um, you'll, you'll get your money's worth. Hire professionals. They're talented. Um, well, their skill, that's how they yeah, spent. That's, that's their thing. That's their skill. That's their craft. That's their art that they spent years yeah. um, developing, just like how we spend years doing what we know how to do. So if so. you're thinking like, oh, I want to cast my, my buddy that uh, is a plumber, but he also wants to be an actor. And, and I mean that in the sense that he doesn't really take it serious. He doesn't go to acting. Like he's not pursuing his craft for real. But, you know, he's your buddy, so you could throw him in. It's the equivalent of you grabbing your one friend that's a plumber that wants to be an artist one day and it ca casting him to uh, or hiring him to do artwork. It's not going to look as great as if you hire a real artist. So 
keep that in mind. It's the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of skill involved in being an actor. And this is the place where you'll find uh, that skill. So, yeah. Okay. That's it. So, anyway, guys, so we're a few minutes over. So, thank you guys so much. Um, any last questions before we go? So that was that was in response to this question. Uh, are we going to talk about it? And we're going to talk about it more, especially once we actually cast the people. Uh, we'll be able to answer more and actually show more photos and whatever. Uh, but uh, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Heining. Ch is it Chady on fire? Or is it Chatty on chatty, fire? It's chatty yeah. or Chady. But uh, I'm seeing this name often, so that's very cool. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, Daniel. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so, yeah. And Shannon, an old friend. Thank you. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks to Noman, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.